The Soviet Union, 1975. The man in charge was Leonid Brezhnev. He didn't look friendly. Was it smart to cross his country by train? Well, it sounded like an adventure. We set off by ferry from Yokohama. Friends and family came to the docks to wave goodbye. Our ship was called the Baikal. It made the round trip to Russia once a week. On board, we played chess with the crew, lugging the pieces from one square to another. They had weights in the base so they'd stay put if the ship started rolling. Otherwise, we watched dolphins or studied the coast slipping past. Siberia looked good. Green hills, rocky cliffs and some quiet inlets. But empty. No one there. Pretty much what we expected. As we filed off the ship into the terminal at Nahodka, two men stood to one side watching. Just bystanders? Or secret police? We were half expecting them too. The train was fast and comfortable. That lasted less than a day, just until we got to Habarovsk. There we got shifted into an older train, much older. There was half a day to waste in Habarovsk, but not much to see and nothing to buy. Our train had a restaurant car and a menu with 21 typed pages, but almost no food. Where had it gone? Easy. At each stop, the train staff were selling it off to the locals. The station shops had next to nothing. Bottled yoghurt, maybe, or bread rolls, or a few potatoes in a bucket. People looked curiously at the foreigners, and the younger ones sometimes gave a shy wave. But they wouldn't come near us. Perhaps they might have got into trouble. Most places had their Onion Dome churches, a surprise in this atheist country, and they all had a statue of Lenin, architect of the mouldy and dysfunctional system they lived by. Thanks to him, people worked for a pittance and waited for the golden communist future when everything would be all right. Between the stations lay hours and days of empty Siberia. Tundra, coarse grass, scraggy birch trees. The sameness was astonishing. A river counted as a big event. Occasionally we saw farmsteads with huge heaps of firewood laid in for the winter. Once or twice a town or village appeared suddenly in the distance, like this one at the mouth of a valley. Shot with a cheap camera from inside a moving train, it had something of the quality of an Impressionist painting. At Novosibirsk, we were joined by Janetta, who shared her food with us, dried herrings, pots of cream and raspberry jam to sweeten our tea. In 1945, she had fought in Berlin with the Russian infantry and taken a bullet through the left shin. She hated war and wept at the memory of it. To cheer her up, we gave her an old shirt and some makeup as gifts for her children, but that made her weep even more. She was so grateful it set us off as well. In Moscow we saw the army. They were pretty good at marching. The Western press said they were poised to attack Europe at any moment, but we didn't believe it. Instead we explored the sights and were sometimes startled by grand buildings and bright colours. But wandering the back streets was better. Moscow folks' homes were often poor, but they looked cosy and kind and human. That's what we'd really come to see. Later we travelled on to Paris, but there was no food on that train either. Someone gave us half a pack of biscuits. The whole journey had taken ten days. But it was an adventure. If they ever ditch that Lenin stuff, who knows, it could catch on. <laughs> <laughs>